My name is Baraganot. I am 30 years old. For all of us, our life story usually begins on the date of our birth. I was born in 1988. My life story begins 44 years earlier. At the same moment, my grandmother Elka Ganot, prisoner number 12750, entered Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. While Dr. Mengele sentenced to life or to death the arriving Jews, he addressed my grandmother with these words. Du bist jung und musst leben und arbeiten. This is German for you are young and you must live and work. Rechts, go right. 1944 is the year when my dear grandmother, Elka Ganot, God bless her soul, an exceptional and strong woman, was just 23 years old. The oldest child of her family out of eight brothers and sisters. 1944 is when the Nazis forced them into the ghetto at their village in Hungary. Later, she and her family were transported to Auschwitz by train. They came to Auschwitz-Birkenau, the biggest death factory in world history. It took three days and nights of travel in a cattle wagon. No food, no water, stuffed, no fresh air, no toilet. Her family was immediately separated. Jews were forced by Nazis accompanied by huge violent barking dogs, all were shouting, pushing, pulling, and aggressively beating to form two lines. The left line, old women, sick-looking women and children were sent to the gas chambers. The right line was sent to concentration camps. Their fate was hard labor and slavery. My grandmother had had left following her mother and sisters Dr. Mengele spotted her. He ran after her. He grabbed her by a collar. He forced her to the right line. This was when he shouted at her the few words in German, which I've quoted in the beginning. The only German words I know. The words that were my grandmother's nightmare since that moment and until her last day. And the words which my story begin with. Her family was executed in the gas chambers within less than 45 minutes from arrival and according to the outstanding, stable, tough, precise efficiency measures and German statistics, they were all dead. Her father Yitzhak died, her mother Rachel died, her sisters Elisheva, Michaela and Hannah died as well. All of that day, within less than one hour, can you imagine her feeling? when a couple told her, while in line, look there, the dark smoke emitting from the chimney are your dears, your family members. They were just gassed and burned to ashes. Can you imagine her thoughts, her fear? I grew up as a grandchild of Holocaust survivor. Those are my roots. These roots have changed and affected my life. I am what I am today because of these roots and I appreciate them. I grew up with the Holocaust stories as a legacy. From my early childhood, I absorbed the necessity of an independent Jewish country with the ability to stand and fight for itself. country which Jewish citizens will never again be slaughtered as cattle. I'm standing here today as a proud combat officer in the Israeli Defense Forces. I grew up in a Zionist family. I absorbed the never ceasing desire named for peace, tolerance, and hope for the better world. At the age of 18, I joined the army. I serve at the artillery corps at a special combat unit called Meitar, which operates a long-range anti-tank missile called the Tammuz. Since then, 
I'm currently serving in my 12 year of combat service. I have fulfilled a variety of combat roles, starting as a platoon commander and having worked my way up deputy battalion commander. I took part in two operations in Gaza, protected three different borders, defended many villages in Judea and Samaria, arrested hundreds of terrorists and restored peace during countless riots. But in spite of all that I've seen, nothing impacted me more than what I witnessed through my binoculars in the Syrian city Kunetra in late 2011. At the time, I was serving as a company commander responsible for 100 soldiers on Israel border with Syria. My mission was to monitor a portion of the Syrian border next to Kunetra Pass. One afternoon, on a relatively normal day, as the sun was shining and the beautiful green fields stood silent, black vehicles, according, black vehicles belonging to the ruthless Syrian shadow militia entered Kunetra and shattered the peace. One of my young soldiers, just 19, ran to me, confused and shocked. Out of the vehicles had emerged men in dark military garb, and they began grabbing men, women, and children from their homes and executing them on the streets. We could not see what took place as these men of pure evil entered the homes of the innocent people of Kunetra. But we heard the screams of torture, of sexual assault across the border. No person, no matter how battle ardent, could ever forget the sights and sounds we witnessed that day. And these so called visits by so called Syrian soldiers continued twice, once or twice a week for years. This experience cannot be described, and it caused me to recall my grandmother's stories, which I partly share with you. By 2013, the entire Syrian medical and civil infrastructure in the area had collapsed. And despite Israel officially being at war with Syria, we knew we had to act. On February 7th of that year, the IDF and the State of Israel opened our border gates to injured Syrian civilians for the first time. I was the company commander that accomplished this unusual and special mission. We provided medical aid to citizens from an enemy country. At the beginning, we were tense. We did not know what to expect. As a company commander, I wondered, are they really injured or just pretending to be and wish to execute a terror attack? But soon it became a daily routine. Injured Syrians kept crossing the border and Israeli soldiers kept collecting them and treating them in the nearby hospital. Currently, the IDF established the aid activity fully controlled by the Northern IDF Command. I want to share with you some facts and figures. To date, more than half a million Syrian citizens killed, 20,000 of them children, more than 13 million displaced, over 11,000 civilians tortured, to death, over 4 million refugees. We are helping as many Syrians as we can, but the need is so much greater. We provided medical help to over 4,000 Syrians. We supplied almost half a million liters of fuel and more than 55 tons of warm clothes. Now, who is exercising humanity and who is exercising cruelty? Israel is in a rough, unstable, and complicated neighborhood. Let's count a few of the many forceful power who desire this small part of the world. Iran, Iran's proxy Hezbollah, Iran's soldier in Syria, and Iran's founded terror organization Hamas. Iran is seeking to build permanent military bases in Syria, creating front headquarters for attacking the state of Israel attempting to build an empire in the Middle East. I hope that my message to you today was loud and clear. 
we will keep our spirit to protect Israel from its enemies. We will learn the enemy and prepare for future challenges. We are ready. I am ready. I will return to the same border, this time as a battalion commander, to keep the border secured and to provide help to injured Syrians. We, the IDF, will make the world a better place. We will keep a strong army to protect the state of Israel. We will carry the beacon of light to and for a better world. I will never forget my promise committed at the age of 22 at the same cursed land called Auschwitz. There, in area A14, I found my grandmother's barrack. When I got back to Israel, I gave her the most precious gift she could ever dreamed of. I gave her a picture as a combat officer in the IDF near the same barrack she was prisoned here. So I'm standing here and promising you and my dearest grandmother, never again. I wish that my grandmother could stand with us here in this room. She would see how much you care about Israel and your warm welcome. And I'm saying, as she would say, Toda Raba, thank you very much.